with Mike Williams on the LHCP experiment. Uh, Mike is, of course, uh, not close by. Uh, he's in a sabbatical in Australia uh, right now. And so actually, Or Hen was scheduled to introduce Constantine, uh, but Or is apparently running late on the telecom, so I got drafted. <laughs> This substitution or these substitutions should not be interpreted in any way as reflecting negatively on <laughs> Quite the opposite. So Constantine did his undergraduate uh, degree at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom, also actually working on the LHCP at that time. Uh, his research now is centered uh, around searches for dark photons and also various applications of machine learning to particle physics. And so we very much look forward to hearing about this. Thank you, Constantine. Thank you so much. All right, as we know, one of the large open questions of particle physics is about the nature of dark matter, which is an unknown substance that constitutes a large fraction of the matter in the universe and is needed to explain galaxy dynamics, for example. There are many theoretical ways of trying to explain this phenomenon. And one example of that is if you have a larger symmetry group that encompasses both your standard model and your dark sector particles. However, due to a lack of detection, both at direct detection experiments and at the LHC, this means that we should start looking elsewhere. So the question is, what if we are not so lucky? What if we have maybe a beautiful dark sector, rich in dark quarks and dark leptons, but, and these can be at any range, at any mass conceivable, relatively, even at relatively low masses. And even in that case, if there's no direct connection between the standard model and the dark sector, these can evade detection very easily. And in that case, um, what does it mean for us to, to de um, detect dark matter? I mean, in this case, what can we do? Does this mean we're stuck? Does that mean we cannot detect dark matter anyways? One simple possibility is if the dark matter interacts with itself via a new force. This new force is in structure, the same as the standard model forces that we know, but is a completely different force that we have not seen before. In this case, um, the lightest dark matter particle can be charged, uh, can be stable because it is charged under this new force. If there, um, if there are particles that interact with both the standard model and the dark matter forces, they can then create a so-called loop, coupling, coupling these two forces and therefore coupling these two sectors. This we call a portal. What is interesting is that these particles here do not have to be the, the dark matter candidate. They, they don't have to be light. This can be up to the Planck scale and so on. And even if they don't exist, to go up to the gut scale, there's other ways of producing this. No matter what exactly happens in this loop, we therefore now have a way of detecting dark matter, um, of getting at dark matter through our deck ma uh, standard model of particles that we know and love. There are four different portals that you can think of, and these are classified by both their spin and parity of their, um, of their mediator. So you can have scalar, pseudo-scalar, vector, and pseudo-vector, and axial vector um, portals. The photon portal, also called the vector portal, is the most viable option in terms of thermal models of light dark matter. So when the dark photon is lighter, than twice the mass of the lightest dark matter particle, it cannot decay into dark matter particles. Therefore, it has to decay into standard model particles. This we call um, visible decays, and which is what I'm going to be concentrating on in this talk. The dark photon couples to the electromagnetic um, current and is suppressed to it in comparison to the standard model photon by a factor epsilon as denoted here. This epsilon is one of the two free parameters of the model, the other one being the mass of the dark photon itself, and this is in the minimal model. This um, epsilon parameter can be between 10 to the minus 5 and 10 to the minus 3 in, in, in a naive calculation. 
So if you naively assume that within this loop you have one or like you have one or two loops, then you calculate this uh, this range of parameters. And here you see an exclusion plot of what has already been done before. What I'm going to tell you. Here on the x-axis, you see the mass of the dark photon. On the y-axis, this epsilon parameter that I just told you about. On the lower left-hand corner, you see the experiments that look at a long decay length displaced vertex and look for these kind of searches. At the top here, you are looking for experiments that do bump ups in invisible spectra. And for example, the Baba experiment looks for um, leptonic like, uh, like Tom and final states in E plus E minus. If we want to cover this region here, then we have to go to higher energies. And in order to do that, for example, one way of doing this is through colliders. One, th one part of the parameter space I want to um, concentrate your attention on primarily is this region here. What I've boxed in here is the parameter space that is what is naively interesting, which is the one we are trying to cover. It is bounded at the top and the bottom by the one and two loop regime and on the sides by astrophysical considerations. In this region, epsilon is small. That means we need an incredible amount of data. And in order to use this data, we need to be very good at rejecting our backgrounds and um, in order to do our searches. So one way, one important thing though, is that even though this box region is what we're trying to primarily fill, any, um, any other region of the space can become interesting if we change our calculation by even a little bit. So we should start looking else everywhere in this space. The LHCB experiment can cover the, this region here because it sits at a um, high energy collider, and it can cover this region because we have a lot of data and because we have a very good way of doing of ver vertex precision invariant mass precision, and um, particle ident identification systems and triggering systems. And this is the LHCB detector, which is going to be used for these searches. <coughs> you see on the red dotted lines where the protons um, from the LHC come in, and they interact at this point here, which is the star denoted here. And we then have a single arm forward spectrometer, which reaches, which goes from roughly, which is instrumented from roughly 1 to 15 degrees from the beam axis. We have a resolution in a lifetime of 45 femtoseconds and a mass of 0.4%. In addition to that, we also have a unique particle identification <coughs> capability. One part of the detector I want you to pay specific attention to is this part here, which is the VELO, which is the vertex locator, which is a silicon strip detector, which we are later going to use to image itself, and that is used to reject material interactions. <coughs> one thing that we are very proud of at LHCB and is very useful, especially for analyses like the one we're going to do here, is the trigger. This is also something I've worked on on my service task. On the left-hand side, you see the um, run two trigger. So run two is 2016, 2017, and 2018. So you get 40 megahertz of bunch crossing rate coming in from your detector. That goes into what we call L0. L0 is a hardware level trigger, which has to make, as any hardware level trigger does, relatively simplified assumptions and has to make um, simple calculations and cut on those. The output of that is put into the um, first um, software level trigger, in which we do partial event construction. And then um, we make our selections, and then we buffer events to disk. While we do that, we perform some online detector calibration and alignment. And we then use that information to put back into our reconstruction. And now we have an offline level um, reconstruction online, and we can make our final selections. And this gives us then an output rate of 12.5 kilohertz. What is important is that this kind of triggering scheme, and especially the way it's implemented, is very flexible. We cannot, in, in what we're looking at here, we're looking at very low momenta, and so we cannot just, for example, look at um, look for high momentum muons or just a lot of hits in our colorimeters or something. We need to do something more flexible. And in order to that, we need a trigger like, like the one I'm describing to you here. 
However, we weren't satisfied and um, with run three, so the next update, we um, are doing something that's even more ambitious. So here we're completely getting rid of L0. We're getting completely rid of the hardware level trigger and everything we read out from the detector directly goes into a software level trigger. This is something that a lot of work has gone into and um, <coughs> is very, we are very proud of it at ACD. And then we buffer once again, perform calibration and alignment, and then once again run the second stage of our trigger. Another part of this triggering system that is very important for searches like this is the turbo stream. Our traditional stream is this full stream. So this is, we take, um, we, we collect the raw event, then we process it, run our reconstruction, our offline level re reconstruction from the second software trigger that I just told you about. And so we keep this. Then offline, if something changes, if we find some mistakes or something else, then we can re-reconstruct this raw event and get another version of this reconstructed event. So this is, in, in a sense, future-proof. However, another thing that we're doing is we're looking at a turbo stream. So here we're so confident in that we can have all of the information that we need for analysis in our reconstructed event that we can completely discard our raw event. This obviously is not useful for some analyses, but it, it allows us to reduce the storage per event from something like 70 to 5 kilobytes per event. This then means we can keep a lot more events for, um, for a given bandwidth. And the search that I'm going to present to you here is one of the first, if not the first analysis at LECB that completely relied on this um, for, part of its, um, for, for part of its track and, um, and this was a poster child for the trouble stream. So at first I'm going to describe to you give you an overview of what we're going to do in order to find dark hole noise. And then later I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So at LHCB we look at both prompt and displays. <coughs> Inclusive, dark photons, go to dynamics. And so after um, the, the dark photon behaves <coughs> like a standard model photon as we said because it couples to the electromagnetic current. So therefore the um, kinematics of both its production and decay are exactly the same as that of an off-shell photon of the same mass. So therefore, after we make stringent particle identification cuts, in addition to detected geometry cuts and various <coughs> other cuts that we need to do, that means we can follow the following strategy. Firstly, we can count the number of dark photon candidates that we do get. Then we find a way of measuring the off-shell photon yield. Comparing these two numbers then allows us to either set limits of this incredibly lucky daily claimer discovery. This means that we now, yes? Yeah, how, what can you assume about how you made the dark photon? All right, so the given that, so this is the minimal model. So there are many different ways of looking at dark photons. The one that's most promising right now is looking at the minimal model, so then it's produced just like the off-shell photon. So therefore, any production that the off-shell photon sees is exactly the same production as the dark photon will see. And therefore, <coughs> given that we know the, the production of the... Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm stupid. You've got two photons colliding. Where does the dark photon come from? All right, so one way of producing it at, at high masses, for example, is Drellian. Uh, at low masses, it's um, uh, it's meson decay. Okay, so, it's so, so this is exactly the same way as an off-shell photon would decay. So these there, are there are quarks involved in making that way. Yes, okay. I mean it's yes, it's. I, I'm just trying to. <coughs> so yeah. Good. Think of it. Think of it. You produce an off-shell photon, and that then basically turns into a dark photon. That's that's a better way. Of, so any way you'd make your your, your photons. All right. Once again, this allows us to do a data-driven search, which makes everything a lot more easy and more robust, because now we no longer have to figure out things like absolute luminosities and efficiencies and so on. Um, here, I've jotted down a couple of the, the numbers of exactly what, um, 
what cuts you make. I have some, some more detailed numbers in the backups. But the one thing I want, to take, want you to take away is the momenta of these muons that we're looking at here. And so the PT of the, the muons are um, 0.5 GeV, and the uh, absolute momenta are larger than 10 GeV. These are not very stringent cuts if you consider that we live um, at the LHC, and so many tracks satisfy these criteria. Therefore, we need um, an experiment like LHCB to push down to these very low momenta. And this is kind of what, is, what we're proud of in this analysis. Let's first look at the backgrounds that we get. So the first background is the background from the offshore photon going to dimeons. This is irreducible. As we just said, <coughs> if we cut this out, then we also cut out our photons, our dark photons. So this we don't really want to get rid of, and this is what we're going to use to normalize our search. Secondly, we have resonant decays to dimeons. So we all know and love that we have um, our standard model resonances, and I'm going to show it to you in a slide, beautiful spectrum all the way from the dimeon threshold to the Z. We see all of the, um, all of the resonances that we would expect. However, these are peaks in the spectrum, and we are looking for a peak in the spectrum. We do not want to rediscover these. So in order to, um, so basically, if we would like to look for a peak on a peak, we'd have to do a dedicated search. And this is not what this is about. So for now, we just veto these regions. And then there are three types of misreconstruction. The first type of misreconstruction is if you have a heavy flavor um, <coughs> decay that is displaced, and we misreconstruct it as prompt. We deal with this with a fit. I will elaborate on in a minute. Secondly, we also have a way where we have prompt hadrons that are then misidentified as muons. And this is because of particle identification issues. And last, um, also, we have a mix of the two. So we have one, um, um, one displaced particle um, reconstructed as prompt and one, uh, uh, and one hadron misidentified as a muon. These last two backgrounds, we're going to subtract through a dedicated sample we've collected, which is same sign dimeon sample. Even with all of these cuts, even with everything, we still have too many, um, too many, too much background. And so what we have to do is we have to, as you said, we have to look at what the production mechanism is for dark photons at large masses, and because they're we still have too much background. And because it's Drellion, we have to make an isolation requirement. <clears throat> Otherwise, we'd be completely swamped by that. This is the spectrum I told you about. And so here, you see how smooth this is. This is pretty pedagogical, except for obviously, sadly, we have this isolation cut that we have to apply here. Um, and just to give you kind of an idea of what kind of numbers we're talking about here. The eta to mu mu yield is roughly 300,000 here, which at the time was roughly 2,000 times the previous combined world's data. That's a lot. So we have a lot of data here. And this is only 2016. So we our searches go from all run to so 2016, 2017, 2018. And this is, we had done a first search <coughs> of 2016, and that's just that data. And because of that, because we saw the spectrum, we saw all of these um, peaks that we were expecting, we could then veto them for the um, um, search later on for, the, for 26, 17, and 2018, which means we could um, reduce our rate, and basically then we could collect more data. We could loosen some other cuts. Um, and so we have three times this data set, basically, or more. And we follow the following strategy. We want to set limits on epsilon squared for each mass. Remember, epsilon is this parameter that shows us how much suppressed the coupling is in comparison to the standard model. And then here, we find the um, gamma star, which is this offshore photon, yield from a fit. Then there are some known factors, which we can simply calculate. And then we have an efficiency ratio. If the lifetime of the dark photon is much smaller than the resolution, this efficiency ratio is going to be one and can be ignored. 
So now what we have is you have all of this right-hand side, which allows us to predict the left-hand side. This is the expected dark photon yield. We then perform a bump hunt, and that gives us the observed dark photon yield. We compare those two numbers, and that's how we set limits. And once again, you don't need to know detector efficiency or luminosity information. Let's concentrate firstly on this normalization, how to get this gamma star yield. Firstly, we estimate the misidentification backgrounds by subtracting the Stanion uh, yields. And here we have a couple of tricks that we have to play because there is um, our main background is um, here is pions. And same sign pions are not produced at the same rate as opposite pi sign pions. And so we have to have a couple of corrections here. And it's a little bit more complicated than I'm saying, but this is the main idea. And we get rid of these heavy flavor backgrounds by performing fits to the minimum IP chi-squared distributions. IP chi-squared is a variable that tells us how good the, um, the fit of the muons to the primary vertexes. So how consistent are the muons with coming with the hypothesis of coming from the primary <coughs> vertex? And now let's talk about the bump hunt. So the bump hunt is we have a very large spectrum, as I showed. So we have to do thousands of fits. So normally, if you do a couple of fits, you can go in and select your background. And that is something that is maybe annoying, but it's doable. Given that we have so many fits, and um, we want to have the best sensitivity possible, Mike actually wrote a dedicated paper um, for this. So the idea is you scan in the in the mass, and this is applicable to obviously other bump hunts elsewhere too. So you scan in the mass. Here we, we scan in half the, the res resolution, which I'm going to denote sigma um, from now on. And then we take a window of 25 sigma and bin it into, into 500 bins. And here our test mass, uh, our test mass is then in the middle, is, is at zero. This means that any Gaussian or anything, any signal model that you're going to draw, is then going to be um, an even uh, function over the space. And that means that, so if we take all, we take all of the odd and some of the evenly drawn remotes in order to fit the background. So what this, is, what this method is doing is it's finding an intelligent way to select our background model. And because the odd modes are all orthogonal to the even signal, there is no problem in, in adding them because it, um, it reduces a potential bias because now we can fit more models, but it does not degrade our sensitivity by increasing variance. The even models could, in theory, be a little bit too, um, could, could bias us. And so for that, we use a kind of type of regularization which is called AIC and is very common in the statistics literature. We get the, um, the, the signal shape from simulation <coughs> and looking at, for the width, we get it from the resonances that are nearby, and this has all been tested and done. So the idea, what's also pretty cool, is if you check, if you allow in the Ranger modes all up to um, order 10, this means, this tells us how wide we allow our background model to fit any bumps in our spectrum that we don't want to be seeing. So this means the genre modes larger than 10 means it can fit any bump in the spectrum that is wider than three sigma. And now we have, um, sadly, we did not find any significant access. Otherwise, you everyone would know already. <laughs> and so these are the results for the prompt search. <coughs> Here, these are the exclusion limits um, as a function of mass, and we see that from the Daimion threshold to 740 MeV, and then once again from 10.6 to 30 GeV, we have the world's leading limits. One, one thing that I still want to say is that here and in all of our searches, we are limited by statistics. That means if we collect more data and we are going to um, all of these searches are going to get a lot better. Let's shift gears a bit and talk about the displaced search. So here, 
we have three backgrounds. The first one is a b-hydron background um, that produces two, two muons. We reject this mostly by um, topology cuts, in addition to a software trigger. So this normally fires if there's some, some bees in the event, and we just veto that. In addition, we also use the bs 2 mu mu um, BDT and bas to basically look at is there any are there any other tracks associated with the um, with the candidate that we're looking at. So we also rejected in that case. Our k shorts to pi pi tail is huge. So we have so many k shorts that even with the stringent um, PID criteria, we still have too many, and this limits our search. And we, that's why we have to look. Um, we our mass range in the display search is limited by this background. And still, we have, even then, we still have a tail that we have to take, care, um, take into account, and we do some extrapolation in order to do this. And lastly, we have photon conversions in the battle. So, LHCB has this velo detector that I pointed out to you. And one problem we have <coughs> is that we have our dark photon, uh, we have um, particles that collide with the material and then produce secondary particles and they point back to the material. And obviously this is not a dark photon decay, this is not something you're interested in, this is material. And our detector description was not sufficiently good enough in order to reject these. So a dedicated effort was started in order to do this in a more intelligent way. So in beam gas into um, uh, collisions, so here we fill our velo, this is a special run, we fill the LHCB <coughs> detector with a gas and then we have our protons still coming in, and they can then basically have any interaction within this range of this velo. Here, this is the along, this is the axis along the beam line, and this is uh, the axis perpendicular. And this then means that if they, if secondary particles then react with the um, with the material in the detector, we can retrace those and build a very beautiful map of LHCb. We're basically using the velo in order to image the velo. And this then allows us to get a p-value assigned to the photon conversion hypothesis for each candidate. And this is something we place a master pendant cut on. We have to make a couple of changes to the prompt strategy. We're still setting limits on these epsilon parameters. We're still keeping exactly the same normalization as we did for the prompt search. And now our efficiency ratio is no longer one because now our dark photon flies a little bit. And so therefore, um, things change. Our detector is, is, is not as efficient, or is maybe more efficient. In addition, we have slightly different criteria in terms of cutting. So here we use a data-driven resampling in which we take actual, um, uh, actual photons, off-shell photons, and then we sample from them. Then we change, we assume they decay a little bit, they, they fly a little bit, and then decay recalculate all of the quantities, recalculate all of the variables um, that our detector would see, and then cut on them, and then see whether um, they would pass. Go on, go ahead. Uh, so, so I'm wondering, you say this is data-driven, but yes. if you take the photon, yes. well, you can't re-decay it and then suddenly get back. So, so what is, what is data-driven here is everything like the background, and it's like everything else that's in like for example, in terms of isolation, everything. We take a prompt off-shell photon and everything around us is data-driven and then it, we take it like that, the, everything around it is data, but obviously that signal decay, then we cheat and we use it like Monte Carlo, we let it fly a little bit. So you embed a exactly. decaying photon into exactly. the data. It is, it, it maybe, maybe if you wanna hear it in different words, we do some kind of Monte Carlo within the already existing background of the rest of the event. So why don't you try to measure the efficiency as a function of the decay parameter by using a short uh, I mean, so given that this is a, so firstly, this is an easy, this is one, one easy way we can do it with the, the data sample we already know. This is something that we know the um, production mechanism is going to be exactly the same and everything is going to be exactly the same. So therefore, we have, we don't have to worry about a lot of these other, um, uh, these other considerations. And this we've we've tested in Monte Carlo, 
um, and we've used prompt dark fault on Monte Carlo and tested it to see if we could predict dis displaced dark fault on Monte Carlo networks. Yeah. Anyways, once again, we can predict the number of expected dark photons that we get out. And now in order to <coughs> set a limit, because we still didn't find anything, surprise, surprise, we um, use a fit in order to do this. And this is a 3D fit in the Damion mass, now the decay time of the particle, and a quantity that tells us how good the fit, um, the fit vertex is. And this brings us directly to the results. So here we see the ratio of the observed dark photons to the expected dark photons in a 90% confidence level. So anything that is blue is lower than one and is therefore excluded. What you see in the shaded blue here is what we excluded in the last search, in the 2016 search. This here, we are very like, we are pretty certain is obviously a fluctuation. And what you can see here is that everything is nearly, is in this one to maybe three region. This means we are very, very close to discovering it, which for us was a little bit of a bummer because it looked like we we're going to exclude all of this. And then sadly, we were not quite there yet. That means with a little bit of data, we can, um, we can probably exclude a very large part of this region. And here, we get, um, this is the overview of the first slide that I showed you with our limits filled in and CMS. And um, we have a, for the prompt search, we have a gain from 2.5 to 1.5. And we now fill in a very large region um, here that no other experiment has uh, had the chance to fill in. And this we're trying to increase. One additional benefit from this data is that it cannot just be used for dark photons. Oh, this is very funny. We can use the same data also to recast it and set limits on other models. So any, if we consider both uh, the production, the branching ratio, and detection efficiency, we can use these to, for example, look at a B minus L model, or a B model, or, for example, a protophobic model. And this can be done by any of these, uh, to any of these searches. This is, this is something that was some already published. And now I'm going to tell you about something that we are working on right now. And this is taking this one step further and looking at non-minimal searches. So I just showed you that the data can be used in order to also look at different um, dark matter models. However, there are some models that still is easily escape our searches that we have just done. And by doing a couple of dedicated searches, we can capture them and have raw distillating sensitivity. For example, if we don't assume that we know the production level, the production mechanism. For example, by just removing this isolation requirements that basically tells us we're looking at Drell Young at high masses of the prompt search, or by adding a B tag to the event, <coughs> assuming that you have dark photons produced in association with Bs, we can have raw distillating sensitivity. In the same uh, vein, in a displaced search, you can get rid of the heavy flavor veto, once again opening this up, or looking at the non-standard topology. So in everything we've done so far in a displaced search, we still require that the dark photon was produced at the primary vertex. This does not necessarily have to be the case in other models. And therefore, here we're opening it up. And so this um, motivates, there are, there are a vi wide variety of, of different models that are interesting here. For example, in the prompt case, we can have um, good limits on light superscalers, and in a displaced case, for example, we can look at dark photons in association with dark axions or strongly interacting dark sectors and the like. There is one big change, though. We no longer have this beautiful strategy where we can normalize to the dark photons. And this now means that we have to present our results as apple limits on cross sections in bins of mass and PT. This means a lot more work for us because now we need to know our efficiencies. Now we need to know our luminosities and there, there are no luminosity measurements out there for LHCB for these years. So we found a way around that. And 
this is still work in progress, so stay tuned. One other big effort that is interesting is pushing this, <coughs> pushing into even lower masses. And we are limited here by the Damian threshold. We cannot produce dark photons that are lighter than twice the mass of muons if we look at the Damian final state. So one way of getting rid of this is to look at dielectrons, which is obviously a way harder job. And so here, we, um, we found a way to get, a, to get this, um, a trigger line like this into, into the trigger. And so we have 2018 data where we're already looking at, which we're already looking at. So the problem here is actually we take, there's no electron identification in our level one trigger, and we need to write a trigger line for it. So we actually, in, very, in some rare cases, we can do electron ID by what is left over from our hardware level trigger that just happens to be saved, and so on. And one big effort for <coughs> run three, to make someone in the audience very happy, one part of the effort um, of run three is that we're trying to move to GPUs, it's one, 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 uh, one idea, to move to GPUs for, for level one triggering. <coughs> and in that way, we could possibly do some of this um, clustering and some electron ID in um, level one in the in the first level software trigger, and this would allow extending these searches and making them even stronger. So, on, in summary, I would like to say that dark sectors are dark matter scenarios that are worth exploring, and LHCb has world-leading sensitivity to quite a few different models. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes. Or? It's not that precise what it's for. And this is an annoying question, so you can ignore it if you'd like. <laughs> I, would, I would like to ignore it. <laughs> I've been seeing this plot since I was a graduate student. Yes. It's not to say much. Yes. Um, and, you know, there was some time where there was a G minus 2 band around that people were excited by. But what always happens is that you just keep on getting larger and larger. So there's always the same fraction of white space. For <laughs> That's particle physics, but um, yeah. Is there an actual motivation? Like, do we know what it does, or we just go all out and? So the answer is the answer is yes and no. Um, let's go back to this. So the answer is yes and no. Obviously, if we could search all of the space, we would search there. <laughs> However, this region really seems to be right now the most interesting. Um, partially, partially because of astrophysics, we're looking at this, this regime, and this really is this one or two loop regime, and this is, this is basically baked in. This seems to be a very interesting region in general, is this, this regime here. So, so However, you, go on. No, the fact that you can look there is, is not a motivation in some sense. Yes, astrophysics, astrophysics. So yes. What, Mm -hmm. So, so um, I have heard several. There's like the uh, whole idea with the co-cost problem and all of this business. There's I, it, things go into and out of um, fashion, and we basically look at self-interacting -inter dark matter. The way we look at it is, um, this seems to be especially um, motivated space because of that, and we're going to wait and see what the theory community, in a sense, decides in the end. Um, but, you know, this is, this seems to be the best region right now. So even though, for example, we as LHCB are exploring this space, this is obviously what we're excited about, but we really, really want to push here. And everyone wants to push here. This, closing this gap is the big deal. Closing this, interesting, but somewhat secondary. Yeah. Other questions? Richard. I guess you know there's a Hungarian <coughs> Would you be would you read plus or minus analysis that's coming up? Would you, you be able to get that low? You think? So I didn't want to mention it, but yeah. So this is something that it looks like we might we might yeah. be able to to catch. And it's exactly so. We um, looking at it naively. It looks like we can we can really get at this, okay. um, but we have not done systematic yeah. studies yet. Yep. Yeah. 
Um, so, what does it mean to be doing like a data-driven search in your model? All right. So, data-driven. Even this comes back to Christoph. So, it's using data in some way. Um, what I what the main point of this search here is where is it? Um, the what is cool about this is that we do not have to measure absolute efficiencies. We do not have to measure absolute luminosities. Because the only thing we're doing is we have a process that we know and love, which is the, 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 the photon, the, the offshore photon. And we have a photon, uh, we have a thing that we're trying to, to figure out what it is. We're trying to compare those two. As I said, like the non mineral search is not as beautiful because we have to do all of this extra work. And there is a lot more uncertainties that creep into the search because of that, because we have, you'll have an uncertainty on our luminosity. You'll have an uncertainty on every one of these efficiencies. This is, this is just extra, a lot of extra work, and at each one of these stages, uncertainty creeps in. What's nice about this, look, look for um, gamma prime, look for A prime. What's the difference? What can we do? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Um, if I understood correctly, towards the beginning of your talk, you, you said that, at least for the time being, you were ignoring the regions where there were already well-known peaks. Uh, is that correct? Yes. So, But I think you also said that, that you would, at some point, try to, uh, to detect things in those regions as well. So I think... So this is not something that, that we as a group are working on. I think there has been some work done and looking at these, uh, at some of these peaks, I'm not sure exactly what they are, but um, a search at LHCB I think has been done, nothing was found. Yes. So I can't give you much more information, but the, obviously if you, if you think about it, the, um, in terms of the mass range that we're covering, most of it, the more low hanging fruit at this point, <laughs> is exactly what we're doing. This is kind of more like a second order, if you, if you I don't want to say, if you have nothing else to, to do. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to find something. You really want to find something. Thank you. Yes. So, how interesting to you is maybe not exactly the detection you want if you're detecting for this dilaton we produce you, a lot. What would you build or what would you change that would be if you wanted to build the most sensitive thing for that particular search? Um, that's, that's a hard question. So one thing that we still want, we, we still, want, still want a lot of data. We have obviously, like data I think in this case is not really the problem. The problem is more electron ID and, and other backgrounds. Um, are you trying to point me at one specific experiment? Yeah. I feel like the answer is I don't know at this point. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what I'd do. There's other, also other searches in terms of charm, like you have D, like D star going to D plus, and, and uh, um, so in charm you can also have a, a dark photon, which is another way of looking with electrons basically. And this is a very beautiful search that we've not been able to do because of this hardware level trigger. And this is something that we will do in run three. So that search, there is not, no one else that can do it as well as us. But given that we already have a beautiful data set, we can, it's looking like we can make a very, right now we don't know what our sensitivity is. It could be that we can have, can cover a very large fraction of that space with not too much work. The problem is just getting into the trigger, finding a way of weaving through the trigger and getting the right events. It's like, what I would change is obviously I want LHCB to just concentrate on this, and if we get if we get all of the trigger output, then we're completely set, and this is not a problem. <laughs> this my this is my ideal experiment. LHCB that only cares about me. <laughs> all right, let's thank Constantine again.